Welcome to the Jackson Rudolph Podcast. I'm your host, Jackson Rudolph, and we are back. This is episode 104, and Jake Presley is going to be on the show today. He's having some technical difficulties right now, but he's logging in from his phone, and he'll be joining me very shortly. First and foremost, I want to update you guys on everything that's been going on in the sport karate world and in my life over the last couple of weeks and why you haven't seen a normal episode of the Jax Rudolph podcast. So if we rewind all the way back to three weeks ago where we had the Battle of Atlanta World Karate Championships, was an awesome event, all types of excellent sport karate action, really exciting stuff in the finals, um, and overall just a great time. One of the things that was so cool for me at the Battle of Atlanta is that we actually ran two live episodes of the podcast there. You can scroll back through Black Belt Magazine's Facebook page and find those. And then I'm also going to get those episodes uploaded to the Jacks Rudolph Podcast YouTube tonight, where we have the complete category, uh, category, the complete catalog of episodes going all the way back. All 103 episodes is all listed on our YouTube channel. So that is the Jacks Rudolph Podcast on YouTube. Um, and that's why I'm going to upload the two episodes that were done live in Atlanta as well. And those were a ton of fun. Basically, the format was to make it like somebody was doing a podcast or a regular television show from a professional sporting event, like a Sunday NFL countdown or something like that. Um, and we did that both on, what did we do? We did it Saturday morning, and then we did it Saturday ahead of the finals in Atlanta. We were originally going to do a show on Friday night, but that didn't all shake out for a number of reasons. Things got really late with the Friday night fights. We didn't have all the talent that we wanted to have on the show, so we just kind of pushed everybody into the next morning. So we did Good Morning Sport Karate on Saturday morning, and then we did Battle Zone Countdown, which was a really fun show where we kind of just had to improv. It was myself, Alex Reyes from Point Fighter Live, and Jeff Doss from Martial Arts Center Network. We even had some random competitors like come up to the podcast booth and ask if they can join in, and they jumped in. So Atlanta was a ton of fun. The week after that was my wedding, and uh, I just saw that Jake jumped in right now, so we're going to add him to the stream shortly, uh, and we will talk a little bit about the festivities at my wedding. And then, of course, we're going to talk about the U.S. Open, which went down just last weekend. Make sure you guys tune in tomorrow night, ESPN 2, 10 p.m. Eastern Time. U.S. Open finals are going to be on television once again. Last year, because of COVID and a bunch of other extenuating circumstances, the U.S. Open was only streamed to SportMartialArts.com, Black Belt Magazine. I think Jungle TV was involved as well. But this year, ESPN is back. So ESPN 2, tomorrow evening, that's Sunday night, 10 p.m. Eastern Time. You don't want to miss that. It's the only time all year that our amazing sport, Sport Karate, gets featured on national television. So I highly encourage anybody that loves Sport Karate, anybody that's tuning into this podcast, make sure you go check it out. But I've stalled long enough, and without further ado, it is time to bring in my man, Jake Presley. How's it going, Jake? Good to have you on the show, my man. What's going on? Thank you for having me, Jax. I'm excited to be back here again, part two. I know, right? I I just wrote it in my notes. The last time you were on the show was all the way back in episode 26. Now we're up at episode 104. So it's a long time coming, but it's the right time to have you back on the show. Now, just for formatting purposes, can I have you flip your phone sideways? Is that a thing? There we go. Now now we get more of your beautiful face, Jim. Okay. (laughs) So we're going to start. I was just, I started the episode. This is the first podcast that I've done since we did like a preview of Atlanta, right? So Atlanta hasn't been covered on the podcast. Of course, we're going to talk about my wedding a little bit because you were there. Duh, you were yes, sir. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to talk about U.S. Open, which was obviously just happened and is huge, right? But let's start. Let's throw it all the way back to Atlanta for you because Atlanta for you was a big tournament as well. You continued your undefeated streak in the traditional weapons grand championship. You also had an epic battle with Mason Stowell in the finals and a rather unique overall grants format that we're going to talk about, right? So just start by recapping Battle of Atlanta. I know it was a few weeks ago, but from your perspective, how did everything go for you and how did you feel about the weekend? So Battle of Atlanta, first off, shout out to the promoters and everybody. They they did an amazing job, a, amazing tournament. Shout out to the Ruths. They're, they're the best. And shout out to our dads for, for helping them as well. <laughs> um, Battle was a very big tournament for me mentally. Um, I've had a lot of lot of doubts, a lot of struggles, and my CMX weapons form is just is not been hitting. I, I've just not felt 
um, where I want it to feel. I was dropping, I was messing up. So at, at the battle, uh, I had um, so, some good divisions. I started off, uh, I had had a drop, but uh, I came back and ended up winning uh, the last two uh, weapons divisions, creative weapons and musical weapons. And, and I was I was feeling good. Uh, the forms I ran, I, I felt good about them. And I was very excited to to go on and and compete going forward. And then uh, the next day, Saturday happens. Traditional weapons uh, take that division, and Dawson t also took traditional weapons. So we had a little uh, the the brothers from from Lebanon came in and, and swept the the weapons uh, in the adult uh, division. So that was very exciting, and uh, we had to compete against each other for the the overall for traditional and CMX. I had a small bobble, but I didn't drop, so I was still still happy with uh not dropping because that's a big big problem i've had um and that built into the the battle zone uh championship night a lot of people wanted me to run traditional weapons a lot of people including like uh like my dad and uh my you know mason stowell's dad <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're expecting me to come out with that traditional weapon that I've been kind of known for probably since 2019. But I was thinking of the US Open coming up. I was thinking of where I am mentally and everything. And I wanted to get on the stage and and just run a form and hit it. And it didn't matter what happened after that, but, but that was the plan. And I was backstage. I was still kind of fighting with myself. Should I do traditional? Should I do CMX? I was texting with... Uh, Miss uh, Lauren Carney and, and Casey Marks. And they were like, you know what? You, you should just go out there, do CMX weapons. And I was like, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm even ready with my music. And, and we were just like, no music. Just go out there, just kill it, show them your power. And, uh, and I felt really good about it. Mason ended up winning, but you can't be upset when Mason wins. It's like, it, he's amazing, so. And we're going to talk about that matchup a little bit because that's a super unique format where your CMX bow form was up against a, a traditional kata, right? But before we get to that, I want to unpack the the first part of this season where, admittedly, you had been plagued by drops here, stumbles there. The CMX weapons division, for whatever reason, just wasn't clicking for you, right? And you said that Atlanta in particular was big for you mentally, and so I want to unpack that some because – you know, winning fixes everything, right? So even though you were having these struggles in the creative musical extreme divisions, it's like the sport karate world didn't notice and didn't care because you were undefeated in traditional weapons, right? So you were still achieving the number one goal of any competitor, show up and win an overall grand, right? But at the same time, you were having this struggle in one element of your competition. So take us through why you think that happened? Obviously, you're out of the slump now. So what was it? Was it over-strategizing, overthinking? Was it something technique that you changed for Battle of Atlanta? What was it, and how did you get past it? I think it was – so I think it almost goes back to, like, 2019. That's when um, I had a lot of tough competition, and I think it was nerves and anxiety kind of plagued me, and it just was going back to back, drop, drop, drop. And then I didn't compete for, you know, a year and a half. So at 2020, at my last tournament and runoffs at compete, I dropped. And then I lost the traditional weapons runoff as well. Uh, I ended up winning the, the forms overall, but, but uh, with the CMX weapons, I've gone, you know, a long time in that drought. And then I didn't compete with CMX weapons for a year and a half after that until Diamonds. So I never had that tournament where I was like back on my game. It was just I was off for, you know, like half a season and then another year and a half and then coming back into it while also dealing with shoulder injury, knee injury, um, halfway through this season, uh, like plantar fasciitis, just never was I hitting my stride physically and mentally for, for years. And I think just with more training, uh, going out there and just doing it more and having my the support behind me is really what helped out. And just, you know, halfway through the year at battle, it just it just kind of clicked. And, and I love how you talk about both the mental and physical aspect of the game. Right. It's a big part was 
working through the, the nerves and the anxiety of going on a stage when you know that you're in the middle of a slump and you're trying to come out of it. But then also it's really hard to come out of a slump if your foot hurts and your shoulder hurts and that's impacting your mobility, which is impacting your technique, which weapons competitors know that's messing up your timing completely, right? And that's going to make it so much harder to hit form. So I think that the story of the way that you, you dealt with that and have now overcome that just winning the U.S. Open with a CMX weapons form, I think it's a beautiful story. If, if, if ESPN did 30 for 30s on sport karate, that, that is 30 for 30 material, right? But focusing on Atlanta, because I wanted to talk about this matchup, because this has been a big point of discussion in the sport karate community, is what are overall brands? Are they done right right now? My opinion is no. How can they be better, right? And so what Battle of Atlanta does is they run off all the overall grand champions and then you compete against each other. How do you feel about that format? I like it, but we're also asking these judges to to judge completely different things. Now, that's kind of what Sport Karate is. It is a mashup of a bunch of different things. But this might pose the question, which is completely fine, because I think this is a might, minute amount of people. Are our judges qualified to judge the best of the best traditional and the best of the best CMX against each other. I think there is some people out there, but to the average judge, how, how do you judge that? If you really have not been in that ring doing that CMX form and also been in that ring doing that traditional form. So I don't think it's necessarily bad, but I think it is a very, I think it's a very tough thing to judge. I think the way you would judge it is how close is the CMX form from being, you know, a perfect form and how close the traditional form is being perfect and whichever one is closer would be the one that deserves a score. But if you don't actually know what that would be, how do you judge that? Right. And I, I think that you're spot on because I think that, you know, I tell people and, and people are like surprised when I tell them I can do this, but <laughs> you can probably do it too. Oftentimes you can predict how a lot of, especially the junior overalls are going to go because the junior overalls are traditional versus CMX exclusively, right? Oftentimes you can predict how that's going to go with a reasonable level of consistency after you look at the panel, because there are some panels that are known to be traditional panels and some panels that are known to be CMX panels where you get judges that have gone, have been on record showing that they prefer CMX forms in those circumstances and judges that are on record showing consistently that they prefer traditional forms in those circumstances, right? And so my solution for this whole thing is, is I think absolutely, Jake, qualifying judges with a system like Promac does, but put that system on steroids, right? I think that qualifying judges and, and teaching them what CMX really is, right? Because there's plenty of judges that do know, but there's a whole lot of judges that don't, right? And so I think that educating judges and having some form of a certification system is huge, but I also think that you can alleviate that burden by making the overall brands make more sense. Because I do think you have to have crossover between divisions. Otherwise, it's not really overall. Like, I think that what NASCAR does right now with men's overall brands isn't an overall grant. Because it's yeah. all of the traditional weapons only against traditional weapons. And the same thing for CMX weapons and CMX forms and traditional forms. That's not overall. That, by definition, is a divisional grand championship, right? So in order for it to be overall, I think you do have to have some crossover. But here's my take, and I want to get your opinion on this. My take is, instead of comparing apples to oranges, why don't we compare red apples to green apples, right? Have it be CMX forms versus CMX weapons for the overall. So it's extreme on extreme, creative on creative, creative on extreme, whatever. And then you have traditional weapons versus traditional forms. And when you think about the matchups that you would get, I think that having – your CMX bow form against, uh, let's assume that you don't win CMX forms, right? Against a Dawson Holtz CMX form or against a Shaquan Parson or a Salaf Salih CMX form. I think that's a very compelling matchup. And I think that Mason Stowell's traditional kata against your traditional bow is a very compelling matchup. And I also, when I've said that before, people have said, well, if you're going to do that, you have to have real traditional weapons, meaning like a Kabuto division 
as opposed to what NASCA is right now, which is more of a contemporary traditional weapons, which I agree. I think there should be a division for traditional Kabuto, but you can run a hybrid traditional form in the Japanese Okinawan division. So I don't have any problem with a hybrid or contemporary traditional bow form going up against the Japanese Kata that in their division may have gone against a hybrid form already, just a different style of hybrid form, right? So I've talked a whole lot because I nerd out about that whole overall grand structure and why I think it should be that way. When you hear me break that down, what's your initial reaction? And do you have your own solution for how you think it should be? The, the first thing that comes to mind is, I, I mean, I think it is cool, but I think you would run into some people, because I've heard this before when uh, like we've competed against um, sync forms competitors against us doing weapons. We've heard the thing that it's, well, weapons has a advantage because they have something in their hands and it's, it looks sometimes cooler. So I think you'd run into some, some arguments there, but what's the difference between doing that and going CMX against traditional? Is it a better comparison? It is a weapon to no weapon, but it's also the same realm. So, so I can, I can see some advantages and, and disadvantages. Maybe we just try that out. It's, we're trying a bunch of other things. It's, it wouldn't be that big of a deal for one tournament to do like a battle zone championship, but you have all the CMX guys up there and then you have all the traditional guys up there. I, th I think that'd be interesting to see. And that's the take that I agree with most. We don't know till we try. So, hey, Battle of Atlanta, Truth Entertainment, if you're watching, next year for your overall grand championship final, why don't you try that format, see how it shakes out. That might be a lot of fun. But now we're going to move on. We're going to move forward in time from Battle of Atlanta because that was three weeks ago. We're going to fast forward one week from Battle of Atlanta, and that lands us at the wedding. Now, I'm not going to take all of Jake's episode and talk about my wedding. <laughs> yeah. But I am, and I know that people expected me to talk about it on the podcast. So, Jake, I'll just let you tell it from your perspective. Just give me a few of your highlights from the wedding. And since we are on a karate podcast, maybe focus on some of the karate. That we're <laughs> uh, uh, I'm going to let you share your experience yeah. from that groomsman I'll, perspective. I'll give some highlights from both because we can't talk about the wedding without saying, wow, it was beautiful. It was it was awesome. What y'all did was fantastic. Just everything, it, it just felt perfect. And uh, it was definitely nice to be able to hang out with a lot of the NASCAR circuit with no worries. And we were just relaxing and it was perfect. Um, uh, without talking about karate, I'll, I'll talk about like two things real quick. Um, Friday night when it was uh, some of the groomsmen, we were just all talking, like Coach Steve was there and, and my brothers and your friends from Stanford and stuff. That night was was awesome, just all of us talking for hours. And then it ended up just being uh, me, my brothers, and yourself, and we talked for a while. And that was great. You know, you're, you're like family, so that was just – it was perfect. Um, moving on, the next day, you know, we had just about everyone in there crying during the ceremony. <laughs> uh, Myself included. Yeah. Um, and, and during the reception, we had one of the, you know, most insane things to happen at a wedding. Um, hopefully a lot of y'all saw uh, Rashad's video he made uh, when he was like, there was one rule, no karate. But, uh, man, well, that, was, that was awesome. Seeing you do some bow staff, and uh, we had a lot of great, talented martial artists there, and uh, we, we showed that off. <laughs> Well, first and foremost, Jake, thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind words about the wedding. And I'm going to give 100% of, of the credit to my wife. Gabrielle planned everything. So every every picture that you saw, everybody that says it was beautiful, Jackson had nothing to do with it. I showed up, I showed up and said I do. Gabrielle did everything else. So I give Gabrielle all the credit in the world for making that happen. Um, and, you know, Jake, you're right. You know, Friday night, I mean, I'm going to remember those conversations like forever, right? And by the time that I think you had left and gone somewhere, Reed was asleep on my couch. <laughs> and then it was just me and Cole. And Cole and I had, I mean, you, you know the stories of like Cole. And this is something I've never talked about on the podcast before. But Cole and I will have like three o'clock in the morning, deep philosophical discussions that like nobody ever hears about. Yeah. One of the reasons that I got to get Cole Presley on this podcast, Cole, <laughs> you're watching your brother's episode right now. Got to get you on the show, man. 
We got to talk about some of this stuff. But anyway, um, no, I mean, it was crazy having like a full on Paul Mitchell family reunion. The chant that we did at the end of the yeah. night, obviously the JPM chant, was, that was so much fun. And see, awesome. we're moving on <laughs> to the wedding now, right? Okay, everybody that wanted to hear it, we talked about the wedding. That was like, what, five minutes? We'll move on to something else now. Um, so we're going to jump to US Open. And we talked about CMX weapons a lot already. I want to talk about CMX forms, right? Because nobody knows this. I alluded to it on the, on the broadcast that was on Black Belt and will be on ESPN tomorrow night. But I haven't really explained what I meant by this. But literally, within five minutes of your division starting for the first CMX forms division during the eliminations, you called me, and I was in the room. I, I just, like, gone to the bathroom or something. You called me, and you were like, I don't think I'm going to do forms. I'm going to do it. Like, my heel hurts. Like, and I was like, Jay, like, literally, it's up to you. Like, if you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, it's really okay. Like, it, it's, it's, it's no big deal. And then in the middle of the conversation, all of a sudden, you were like, okay, yeah, I'm going to do it. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, cool. Go do it. Like, I think you can win it. So go do it. Yeah. So next thing we know, I walk back over to that side of the room, and Jake has bowed in. So take us through the fact that you literally were, were like seconds away from not doing the division at all. 24 hours later, you were the ISKA champion. So tell us about leading up to that very first elimination round. What's going on, man? So, so I, can, I can start this story like – from a while back, or do you want to hear just U.S. Open perspective, or every as far as you want to, man. So CMX Forms, the last time I competed, 2020 compete, um, I ended up winning the overall. Um, and after that, you know, 2020, nothing happening, training and everything. Towards the end of the summer, I was I was burnt out with everything. I was going to the gym and working out at the school every day, and and I burnt out. Um, didn't really have too much going on with training. And then injury number one happens. I, I think at that point it was my knee. And then later on was a shoulder and then my foot. So coming back after COVID to compete, I, I was still dealing with those injuries at that 2021 US Open. That's why I only did traditional weapons and forced us into that sink division. Um, that's the only CMX I did was was the sink and just my traditional weapons. And then moving on, you know, I started doing CMX weapons. But because of me just not being there mentally and physically for the CMX weapons, I wasn't ready to add on another another division. So then come around at Warrior Cup, it's like I want to do forms, but I'm not ready yet. Compete, it's I want to do forms, I wasn't ready yet. Oh, I should say I want to do forms. I ended up doing half of a CMX form on stage. Uh, though granted, uh, I was uh, pretty tired at that end, so all my tricks were like going down to the knee and coming up. Uh, nothing super solid, but uh, at least I got out there and did it. About Atlanta comes, I want to do forms. I think I was signed up for forms, and then I was like, I, I can't handle it yet. My my heel was r really hurting. Use up and comes, still dealing with injuries. Better though, shoulder, not not a thing anymore. It was mainly the foot, but I was going to through rehab, rehab and everything. So I, I, I was pretty healthy. But what was lacking is the, enough training. I had a couple weeks of training that form, nothing huge. And I still haven't done amazing with CMX weapons. I've won divisions, but I wasn't doing well in the overall. So it was, I don't think I'm going to do it because that Friday night, I have to run two overalls. Now, because of injuries and everything, my cardio is not the best. My endurance is not the best through that whole day. So I'm already four forms in, and I'm thinking, man, I can't get through another form and two overalls, I don't think. I bow out of my musical forms division. In my head, I'm not doing forms. I think I have to do... <laughs> I think I have to do overalls tonight. I've already had a pretty good. Uh, I had three first at this time. So I've had musical forms. I'm not doing it. I'm just watching people compete now. Going to my teammates' divisions, going to competitive edge. I come back to my division, to the ring. I'm already kind of, I'm out. They put me in that division because I wasn't there to bow out like the first one. I was put into the shuffle when I've already kind of decided I wasn't doing it. 
so now I'm like, I, you know, I, I just took someone's spot. I got put in the shuffle. I, I'm like, well, it, you know, in 10, 15 minutes from now, when it's my turn, if I'm feeling hurt or something, I'll, I'll bow out then. So I, I then go in, I bow and then I call you. I'm like, Jackson, I'm, I'm in the forms division right now. And you're like, what? You told me you weren't doing it. I'm like, I, I don't know. And as you said, you're like, you, and you know, do what you feel is right. And I was like, I do not know what is right. <laughs> I'm like, I want to do it. But I was like, but man, I got two overalls already. I'm like, ah, it wasn't until I think two people before me, that guy was finishing. Um, I just had this little epiphany moment because my, my nickname is, com came, is, is coming back from 2020 of, of the wild card. And I was like, what's something that the wild card would do? And I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So, so I went out there. I kind of had trained the form Thursday night after the seminar. So I was like, I'm, I'm going to go out there. And I'm going to run that form and just whatever happens, happens. If I, if I fall, you know, I'll be mad at myself. But, you know, I'll throw down the wild card <laughs> and ended up hit, hitting the form. And I felt really good about it. So two big takeaways there, right? Number one, you know you're good if your biggest problem at a tournament is, I got to run two overalls like this, <laughs> right? So that's a good problem to have. Right. I love how casually you were just like, man, I had to do those two overalls. So there's that. <laughs> right. And then the other part of this is you won the NASCA overall grant in the daytime. You won the U.S. Open title Saturday night and you basically didn't train for the division. Right. Like the level of, of skill that it takes to be able to do that against top competition. I mean, you were up against guys who have each won overall grants this year in Dawson Holt, Solid Lees, Shaquan in the division. He's an overall grants winner from back in Chicago. And that's what makes that particular division right now so incredibly compelling is that at every single tournament, there's been a different winner of that overall grand championship. So it'll be very interesting to see in this latter part of the season, which one of you kind of takes the reins on that division and winds up claiming – really the most coveted title you can win on NASCA, which is the overall world champion winning the most overalls in a given division for the season, right? So I want to talk about you stylistically a little bit since in the last three years, people haven't gotten to see much of your CMX form. And I see a lot of different things in it, right? I see obviously some of Reed's influence on you in your hand combos, the way that you throw your hands. And Reed was a very good CMX Forms competitor. Everybody remembers Reed for double bow. But after this episode, everybody tuning in, go YouTube Reed Presley CMX Forms. He won a number of overalls. I think he got a diamond ring. He might have even gotten a U.S. Open with CMX Forms, right? So the guy was good at CMX Forms. Go back and study that film. So I see a lot of Reed in your forms, Jake. But one thing, and this is no disrespect to Reed, you're a better tricker. And you having more abilities as a tricker makes you a, a more dangerous threat in that division more consistently, in my opinion. So talk a little bit about how you see yourself stylistically as an extreme forms competitor, but also some of your other influences. I know obviously Marcel Jones probably has big influence on you, so you can break that down for us a little bit more. Yeah, I would say the, the two biggest influence would be Reed and Marcel, for, for sure. Um, the, the idea when I'm going out there to do the form – is is kind of similar to my cmx weapons is speed and, and power now i'm not as strong as reed i'm not gonna claim that <laughs> reed is one strong guy but where i'm not as strong i'm trying to be a little faster and and maybe have a couple bigger tricks um and, and that's where I'm, I'm different from reed and um there's a couple other hand combos i've worked with marcel and that i want to get into my form but uh, they weren't they weren't prepared for this tournament. But going out there, I'm trying to just be. I, I want to make it obvious that I'm stronger and I'm faster. And then when I'm doing my tricks, I'm trying to keep that same speed and power into those. So my first uh, combo, I try. I go fast into a spin, hook kick, boom, beat twist, round hard, cheat night round, boom, come around. I did a big D leg after that. I was just trying to stay fast and hard through my tricking 
and through my hands and everything. And that's kind of similar to how I'm looking at CMX weapons. I'm trying to be fast and hard, keeping good technique. But when I'm doing those tricks, I'm not breaking up my pace. I'm trying to do my, my tricks and my bow tricks. I'm trying to keep it that same speed, if possible. Of course, there's, there's things that are going to affect that. But that's, that's the goal. And I love that because I think that's the perfect strategy for you. You have something that works so well in the weapons divisions, both traditional and CMX. When you talk about your explosiveness, your ability to maintain that speed and flow throughout a routine and transferring that over into open hand forms makes perfect sense. You know what I mean? So I think that that is um, an excellent strategy. It's obviously working for you. And I'm going to put out a warning to the sport karate world right now because Jake talks about, oh, I got, I got this new hand combo. I got this. I got that. This man's got some tricking in his bag that I don't think anybody knows about. Not going to reveal what it is because that's, that's Jake's secret. But this, this dude's got some stuff in his bag. When he decides he wants to throw it, there's not many people that can throw it like he can. So I, that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to hype you up a little bit there, Jake. Thank you. But it's the perfect transition to now talk about your strategy of weapons because I feel like – and it's not, it's not a problem. I'm going to use the word problem, but it's not a problem. This is for lack of a better term. But I feel like one, I'll use the word issue, which I guess is a synonym, whatever. I'm just going to say it, right? One issue with the CMX weapons division right now is because I have a lot of students that come to me and they always want this next big trick. Or they want to put more tricks in their phone, right? And it's because there's this apparent arms race to see whoever can do the biggest, hardest trick or can do the most tricks in one form is going to be the person that wins, right? And I think the reason that perception has been popularized is because of how deep the talent is in that 16, 17 division right now, right? When you've got guys that are all capable of so many big tricks like Esteban Tremblay and Ben Jones and Mason Bumba and with Thomas Philip Brume, and the list goes on and on. There's a ton of talent in that division. And they're all really good at doing really, really difficult tricks. And so the perception is if you want to win, you have to do all of the, the newest, the hardest tricks, right? But one thing that I firmly believe in, and I preach this to students, you got to have good tricks to win. There's no question about that. But tricking and bow tricks, weapons tricks, any definition of tricking is not the primary scoring component for the judges. It's the martial arts first. Many judges would tell you it's the performance and the way you sell the form second. And then it's the difficulty and all of those extra factors. But if your karate is not as good and if you don't put on a show with it, it's not going to matter in the eyes of most judges. And that's one thing that I absolutely love about your game is that you embody that beautifully. Your strategy is I'm going to go out there. I'm going to strike harder. I'm going to strike faster. I'm going to mix in some of my own bow tricks that have difficulty and are unique and stand out, but I'm not going to let my form be overrun by the tricks, right? So tell us a little bit about your perspective on that whole situation. That's the right word for it. It's a situation. situation. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Tell us your thoughts on that whole situation. And then also speak a little bit more, because you're the guy doing it, to that strategy and the way you put together your form. So, so my strategy is, is kind of with a theme, uh, it's, it's, you know, being aggressive. And, um, now I'm not going to say I can't do, you know, the, the hard bow tricks, but can I do them the way I want to have my form look like, if I'm going to do this trick, I'm going to have to slow way down. If I'm going to do this trick, I have to throw the bow, not as fast. Um, and I think the way I execute a lot of my tricks, there's very minute amount of people that can do them as fast or the way I do them. Mm -hmm. So it's not that that trick is necessarily easier because I'm doing it a, a way that is, is a lot faster um, than some people. And that you, you've seen the way I've ca caught certain things. Sometimes I go a little too fast. Don't get me started. <laughs> My double box cutter is spinning a little bit too much. Even on stage, I dodged the bow a little bit. <laughs> came around. I let it spin a little bit more. Boom! And then landed. Um, I don't want to throw a trick in there just to throw just to throw a bow trick in there. It, it's going to – there has to be a reason for it. Um, even going into the, the nighttime um, final, uh, the ISK championship, I 
had a trick up my sleeve, um, as you know. And I, when I was going into it, I was like, I don't feel good about this. I think it might mess up my pace. I don't know if it's consistent. I think it just wasn't wasn't where I wanted it to be. And I didn't want to just go out there and throw another boat trick. Just cause we're, we're still doing martial arts now. I'm in that in-between in thing where I'm not saying we have to have everything needs to be traditional bunkai and everything. But also, we are doing martial arts. So we have to have something in there. So I'm trying to kind of find that middle ground. I want to be extreme. I want to be creative. But I still want to have some good basics. But I'm not going to go only into the basics. And I think that, that that's so important is the balance, right? Because like all of those great, talented guys that I talked about in 16, 17, all of them have good traditional martial arts foundation. They all got black belts. And I mean, half of those guys are trained by me, right? So I told them like, hey, you better strike right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so it's not that people who do that volume of tricks aren't good at executing the traditional martial arts, but it's about the balance of it in the routine, right? That's the thing that a lot of people who watch sport karate and then criticize it automatically don't understand is that what you see in the routine and what an athlete is capable of are not always the same thing because the routine is always dictated by what the judges are going to give the win to. Athletes are always going to do what wins, but what might be the most true to the martial arts, that athlete may be able to show it, but doesn't showcase it in the ring because it's been proven time and time again that the tricks is what wins by certain counts of judges, right? And I would like to say that I think some people are forgetting that CMX is a new art style. Yes. It isn't just church moves. It is, it is becoming more of its own thing. Now we take those moves and we change into something else, but just because it's something different and not traditional martial arts doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. It's just different. It's it's a different art style. I think some people kind of forget that it, it is, especially not kind of becoming its its own thing. Now, when it is starting to become not martial arts at all, and then it's like, well, right. may, maybe we're just dancing or doing baton twirling. But, right. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying there? Your style so much is that you make it a point to make that a featured part of your performance. You make that part of the equation. If anybody's going to compete against you and want to try to beat you, they're going to have to show that they're capable of that level of martial arts because of the way that you've choreographed your routine, you forced the judges to consider that, right? You didn't just say, I'm going to try to, you know, match everybody's ability of tricks and weapons tricks and all this. You said, I'm going to do my tricks and I'm going to show the judges that martial arts has to be considered in this division. Right. And that's one thing I really respect about your style. And there's others in the adult division who do the same right now. Right. We were talking about you sweeping weapons in Atlanta with Dawson Holt. Dawson's another one who does that beautifully. Mr. Clean. I focus on the martial arts and have the tricking in there. You had a comment there? I just said Mr. Clean. <laughs> exactly. Holt. Right. Um, so anyway, I could go on and on about this all day. I also love the fact that you brought up the whole like, it shouldn't be all bunkai because this is where we're creating something new and this is a performance art and there should be practical martial arts in there and that should be the majority of it because it is a martial art form but having the extra stuff on top of it is part of what we do and to anybody that is a traditionalist that chimes in and says well that means it's not martial arts i will tell you when's the last time you used a cat stance in a fight because I'm pretty sure you probably haven't used a cat stance in a fight. They're just to look pretty too. But that's beside the point, right? Somebody's trying to get people mad at you now. I know. Somebody's going to get mad at me for saying that. But that's okay, right? And I understand that cat stance teaches a weight balance that is then used to help you generate. I get it. I get it. I don't need the lecture, okay? So now, Jake, we're going to focus specifically on sport karate and not get into that age-old debate of this, that, or the other, right? And now I want to I hit you with some history here, right? Because I think this puts everything that happened at U.S. Open into perspective, particularly in that weapons division. I was thinking about this literally in the shower this morning. These, these are the shower thoughts that Jackson Rudolph has, right? In the last 14 U.S. Opens, there have only been seven 
men's weapons champions across those 14 years. Now, I didn't tell you this when I sent you the game plan for the podcast because I just wanted to see if you could do it off the top of your head uh, because I did it off the top of my head. But then I'll give you the answer, right? So it goes all the way back to 2008, and I'm not going to do this totally unfair. I'm going to give you a hint that 2008 to 2011, that four-year stretch in the men's division should be pretty easy to figure out. I'm, but let's see how far I, you can get. I'm pretty sure I know. I'm pretty sure I know four. And is the seven including me, or is that before? You are the seventh. You are the seventh men's weapons champion in the last four. So I need six names. So of course Jackson Rudolph. So I'll, I'll, when I go back through it, I'll go chronological order. But yes, Jackson Rudolph, Reed Presley. You got it. I, I, there has to be probably both Matt and Calman. Mm-hmm. Well, Calman was the first four. That was the gimme I was trying. Yeah. To. So that's. The, la- the last two are the hardest. Last two. Let me think. <sighs> By the way, if anybody's listening to this conversation and you think your martial arts history is good enough, your sport karate history is good enough, drop those two winners in the comments. The years, by the way, here's a hint, Jake. The years are 2013 and 2014 men's weapons U.S. Open titles. Is one Kyle? No, he was on stage for one of them. That's a good guess, though. Micah Carn? Not Micah. That's a good guess. I think Micah won forms in 13, maybe? Or maybe 13 and 14? Who am I, who am I forgetting? Who am I forgetting? So the, the division in 13, because this one, I, I remembered the winner, but I wanted to look it up to see who all was in it. The division in 13 was Kyle Montagna, Austin Jorgensen, Hmm. Austin Crane, there might have been one more, Shaheen Jahan Vash, and then the winner. Man. And actually, I think I think this competitor won double U.S. Opens in 2013. Man. I think they won forms and weapons. And I'm surprised nobody's commenting. You're not the only I'm- one. No, this is the hard one. This is different. I'm I'm drawing a blank for some reason. I was there. I probably watched it. <laughs> it was Sin Gao, bro. Oh, what a, that was I, the Sin Gao I season. was thinking about him, but I forgot he had the, the double. Oh, man. That was the Sin Gao season. Yeah. So anyway, now he killed I'll, everybody. I'll nerd out and I'll go through the years, right? So the 2008 to 2011, that four-peat, that was Calvin's four-peat, right? That was... The Kalman Prime, double sword. So 8 to 11 was Kalman. 12 was Matt. So Kalman retired. Matt did his retirement tour, won at U.S. Open, and then he, you know, had his curtain call. So Matt won 2012. 2013 was the Sengau year. 2014, so 2013, it was Reed and I in the junior division, right? 2014, Reed goes to the adults and drops. Tyler Weaver was the other name. That was, that was, he, was he was on my mind. Mm-hmm. And then uh, 15, 16, those were both Reed. And then I was the next four. And then obviously Jake Presley, 2022. So now hearing that list and knowing that like when there's 14 U.S. Opens and only seven winners, right, you know you're in a pretty select group. So I'm going to ask a simple question. How's that feel? It, it, it feels unreal because even though I forgot a couple of the names, I was there probably watching just about every one of those and and a few of those guys like you reed tyler like y'all are teammates y'all, y'all are brothers of course a couple other uh teammates but they were they're they're legends to me you know that was those were the guys you know matt and calman um to be a part of something like that is is awesome it's going to be something that i that I keep with me the rest of my life it's uh it's just a good feeling. Of course it is, right? And that's something that's so cool. And, and I think a lot of people don't get this like we get this, right? So you hear oftentimes sport karate podcasts feature people who are further removed from the sport than we are, right? You're still an active competitor. I'm just recently stepping away from competing, right? And so, which not forever, I reserve the right to come back whenever I can. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't think that I just gave something away. 
But anyway, right? But typically, like, people who come on social media and do these shows are people who have either been retired for the last, like, five, six to ten years or people who maybe even still compete, but their prime was back in that era, right? And so they always talk about, oh, it was Mike Chapman, it was Carmichael Simon, it was John Valera, there was Ming Lu, there was Casey Nash, right? Which Casey still competes, which is crazy, right? <laughs> but for you and I, when we were in that position, when those guys were all watching Valera and Chad and Carmichael and so on, for us, it was it was Matt and Calvin and Rudy and Mark, Lauren Carney. It was that group, right? And so I wish that we could give that group their flowers more often because I feel like there's a generation gap where – People forget, they don't forget those legends, but like I've told this story on the podcast before, so I'll just briefly mention it. But there were some young competitors who they were doing an interview at, at Diamonds with me a couple of years ago. And we finished up the interview and uh, I had referenced Cal Machoka in the interview. And then off air, these kids look at me and they're like, who was that guy you were talking about? And I was like, excuse me, what? what, <laughs> what? And they were like, what, what, Calman was that? I was like, you're in the Diamond Nationals. You know, Calvin Choka practically owns this tournament. What do you mean you don't know who Calvin Choka is, right? Um, and so, again, like, any time that I'm on this podcast, I try to shout those people out as often as possible because they deserve it. And they literally inspired me, inspired you. Like, they they were our Chat Valera Carmichael. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that's, sure. that's why I think it, it's so important. Um, but anyway, so enough of the history stuff. Well, 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 well before we move on. I'd like to throw one more name in there. It's been a it's been a kind of discussion with a few people. Now this is not a competitor or in that era or someone like that. But I want to shout out one of the underrated goats. I one know what you're saying. Go the for underrated it. goat. Go on, Jason. Jason Warren. He is fantastic. He is amazing. The things he's done with us and Dawson Holt as us. I mean, like my family and Dawson and some competitive edge competitors. He is fantastic. Not enough people know it. Without Jason, there's not the Presleys. There's not the Hulk. Jason freaking Warren. Shout out to that guy. One of the underrated goats. Have him on the podcast. Yes, we got to make that happen. So, J-Dub, if you're watching, we need you on the show, my man. Jason Warren, Cole Presley. We need them in episodes on this show, okay? Uh, but to what Jake is saying, right? There's, and anybody that's tuning in, in the comments, add some names here if there are any. But thinking of coaches who have coached students literally from like white belt, right? I'm not talking about, you know, oh, well, they helped him out later in their career or they were their competition coach. No, no, no. I'm talking about like instructors. So there's a difference between having a coach and having a sensei, right? Shout out Joey Castro for that quote. We had that conversation Saturday night. There's a difference between having a coach and having a sensei, right? So I'm talking about sensei, in your case, Sabanin, Jason Warren, right? I don't know if there's anybody else that's ever trained five ISK world champions, and not only ISK world champions, Team Paul Mitchell members. Avery Presley, Jake Presley, Lee Presley, Cole Presley, Dawson Holt. Jason Warren's the only one that I know of. Dawson Holt. Proves Dawson Holt proves it's not just the Presley thing. He proves that it is a Jason Warren thing. Hey, Genie Amato, great point. And it's so easy to not think about because he's so present since a Sharky. Oh. Got people who have taken people from White Belt all the way up. In their case, it wasn't always to Paul Mitchell because, you know, Sensei's AKA. So they were going to AKA, right? Um, but absolutely, Sensei. Sensei probably has at least five that were like white belt to U.S. Open. We know Micah, Craig Hennigson. Was Craig Hennigson a white belt with Sensei? Matt Mullins probably, right? And Brendan Hewer. Yeah, anyway. I would, I, is, we need to have Sensei back on the show. He's been on the yes. show. But anyway, we've, we've, I've talked about all the people he's influenced, but I don't know the people that he's taken from white belt all the way up. Yeah, I mean, Sensei has influenced my family for sure. Like, he, he's, he's awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Jenny Amato, for shouting out Sensei Sharky. But, like, that might be the whole list, right? And, of course, as soon as I say that, somebody's going to comment somebody else's name that I've now disrespected, right? <laughs> but anyway, right, 
But Jason Moore and Sensei Sharpie, those are the only two people off the top of my mind that have trained that many ISKA world champions from white belt all the way up. Uh, so, Jake, you, you did the whole monologue to say his name, but please tell us more. Who is Jason? Jason Warren. Jason Warren, from my perspective, he knew my family before I was born. So Jason Warren has been a part of our family since I was born. So as soon as I started walking, he was teaching me how to kick and punch in our basement. We would have, he would teach classes in our basement of our neighborhood. We just have a couple of neighborhood kids because he was going through culinary school at the time, but he loves martial arts so much. And we actually met him or my family met him through a martial arts school. So keeping martial arts going, teaching some classes in our, uh, in our basement. So I grew up with him teaching me punches and kicks and working with Reed's uh, broken bow staff, using like half of it. Um, and he, he made us uh, into who we are as competitors. And he drove, like, he would not teach us or other um, uh, students at the school CMX martial arts until we had solid traditional martial arts. And it has stuck with us for sure. Um, it, it would be a big point of his with any of our students and us it's once you have a good, we were doing, we are, we were a Taekwondo school. So once you had a good uh, Taekwondo form then, and a good traditional weapons form, then we'd get into the CMX. And I mean, he's been, uh, been with us every step of the way and through, he's traveled with us for years, years. And, and especially with traditional weapons, I would not be where I'm with traditional weapons specifically because of, of, um, Mr. Warren. And he, he called back. I saw this post recently on Facebook. Um, it was like seven years ago. And he was like, I think Jake's one of the, this was before all of my success with traditional weapons, really. He was like, I think Jake's one of the strongest pound for pound traditional weapons competitors um, when I was like 12 years old. And so, so he, he called some of my success forever ago and couldn't, couldn't have done anything without him. That's awesome. A great tribute to somebody that absolutely deserves it. So shout out Jason Warren. And again, we got to get him on the podcast too. Yes. And now moving on, the next thing I want to talk about, we've talked about all the recent events, right? Crown of Atlanta, wedding, U.S. Open, crazy few weeks, right? But now let's rewind the clock a little bit. Jake, you look back over your entire career, what are some of your favorite highlights? This is your opportunity Brag on yourself a little bit, right? What are some of those big moments that you feel like has defined your career up to this point? And we know there's still more to come, which makes it that much more exciting. Right? Uh, I'm going to skip over highlight number one because I know uh, we're going to be talking about it in a second. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over that. And I would say, I mean, obviously this past weekend, that that has been my single best tournament yet with with three overall um three overall wins two isks um I, I dropped one division but everything else i won so that was to be able to go on that stage and have that success was was, was uh, amazing and just shout out again to, to the people that have been supporting me like my family your family, uh, Marcel Jones, Jason Warren, Lauren Carney, um, the whole Paul Mitchell um, team, uh, and that it really all came full circle um, at that that tournament. I, ju I just felt all of the the people behind me, and so that was just a big big moment. And to put that into some historical perspective, people. Three overall grand championships in one tournament under the current format. So like in football, they say in the Super Bowl era, right? Under the current overall grand championship format in this era, that feat has only been accomplished one other time. Jake is the second person to do it ever. And he did it at the U.S. Open. He's the first person in U.S. Open history to do it. And he didn't just win the daytime eliminations. He then went and won both of the ISKA finals that he was eligible for. And what's really special about that is that one of them, he was going to be in the men's weapons final no matter what, because he's undefeated in traditional weapons. Everybody knows how skilled he is in the CMX weapons category. 
he was a shoe in through the selection process for the weapons division. He could have not competed in the eliminations and been in the weapons division, right? Forms, you literally earned the only wild card spot, fitting with the nickname, right? <laughs> and made it to stage and won the whole thing, right? So not only did you have like the, hey, I've been dominant and you're gonna put me on stage for that reason in weapons, but you also had the, you haven't seen me do this yet, so let me surprise everybody and went this way in forms. And I don't know if that's ever gonna be repeated in that way again. So the way that you had this US Open unfold for you, truly unprecedented. We won't see something like it again for a long time. And congratulations on that one more time. Th thank you so much, Jackson. Couldn't have done it without your support as well, man. Well, thank you. Bro. I know you're saying that to be nice. No, I'm not. <laughs> We should have been going for six, though, Jackson. Hey, hey, hey. Ben, ben and Esteban took care of that. Okay. What Jake is congrats to them. <laughs> Excuse me. What Jake is referencing is that we had a streak going, a record streak of ISKA synchronized weapons titles, which was five in a row. And we gave up that streak for me to be in the booth instead of competing this year. But. It was extended to a seven-year streak because before our five, I won one with Kyle. And so Paul Mitchell had won the last six U.S. Open Sink Weapons titles, but then Ben and Esteban were able to win it again. So the Paul Mitchell streak is alive, seven straight weapons titles, and uh, hopefully it'll repeat again next year. And who knows what the Paul Mitchell team that does it next year. Anyway, so Jake, you referenced another story, and this story has come up a lot primarily because it was on my Instagram story, right? So for anybody that didn't see it on my Instagram story, the night that Jake won, I posted the scene from Endgame of Captain America. Reed, sorry to steal your thunder on the Captain America nickname. It was, it was perfect, okay? The scene was perfect, okay? Um, but it was the scene where Captain America gives his shield to Falcon to be the new Captain America or however that works, right? So it was that scene. I posted a screenshot of that scene then I posted the picture of Jake and I carrying Jake's Warrior Cup off stage from the 2014 Warrior Cup um, and kind of meant it symbolically. I didn't caption it or anything because if you know, you know. Um, but it was symbolically that was the passing of the torch, right? I gave up my title. I'm done with it. It's somebody else's turn. And Jake was the one who grabbed it and, and went and ran with it and won the whole thing. Right. Uh, so I got a lot of questions because that picture resurfaced about what the story was behind that 2014 Warrior Cup. Jay, tell it from your perspective. So I think I might have I think I might have mentioned this last time I was on the on the podcast. But you want to hear the whole story? Of course we do. Sorry. OK. OK. So. Right. So 2014, um, you had at that point been been definitely a mentor it helped me with my form i think i even had a green bow staff it definitely has been a huge influence up until that 2014 time and we had talked about it prior it was like we're gonna make it so that we're competing against each other on that for, for the warrior cup so as the as friday night happens you know we, we both win our respective divisions and we're like all right now now to the next step we got to win our runoff we win the runoff. Then it's like, all right, to the next step. We win the overall. And then I like run up to you and it's like, I, I think I won first. And I was like, you better go out there and win. <laughs> Don't mess up. So then we, we were ready to compete against each other for the Warrior Cup. And, you know, from my perspective, it was just go out there and, and do the best form you, you could do and have fun with it. And uh, so it's always what my dad would tell me. He's just like, go out there. You have nothing to lose. Just give it everything you got. Um, but then, of course, you know, young Jake had a little card up his sleeve that I didn't know I was using until afterward uh, when I walked up on stage before we were competing and, uh, and uh, told you, you know, uh, don't hold back. <laughs> um, that was uh, part of the part of my success there but uh after you know we both competed and i won you did uh just in un many unforgettable moments happened after that when you picked me up put you on uh put me on your shoulders and uh i think i might be crying in some of the pictures and then of course the picture you posted with uh, helping me take the warrior cup off the stage it was uh 
I wish I could. Uh, I wish I could witness that again. Yeah, it was. It was such a, a cool moment. And from my perspective, like what Jake's saying about about the comment he made, because he didn't mean for the comment to do anything, right? And in Jake's defense, I still hit a form. Like it's not like I just went out there and gave it to him. Like no, Jake legitimately beat me and won that night, right? Um, but well, from my perspective that they had us come up on the stage from different sides, right? And Jake was all of, what, 10 years old then? How old were you in 2014? 2014, I was six, seven, eight. I was like 11? Yeah, you were 11, right? And so tiny little Jake <laughs> struts up to the stage. And, uh, you know, we meet in the middle of the stage, and I go to, like, you know, bro hug, shake his hand, whatever. And a after we embrace and then separate, he looks at me, he points at me, little Jake points at me, and he's like, don't hold back now. And I'm like, okay. Come on, right? Um, and so at that point, I was like, like emotionally so conflicted of like, I want to win, but like I don't want him to lose, right? And so uh, I go out there, I did, I did my normal form, but then Jake brought the house down too. So Jake, you nailed your form. I don't know if you remember this part, but the music cut out in the middle of your form, which if anybody that watches sport karate, you know, music cutting out mid form is like a superpower. Right, because with the music, it, it's second only to when the lights go out. Like if the lights go out, somebody finishes their form, everybody loses their minds. Right, yeah. second on that list, it is like a superpower if your music goes out and you keep going for some reason. Because like as competitors, it's really not that big of a deal. Like no. once we're going, we're just going. You know what yeah. I mean? But to the crowd, if the music, like the speakers, go out and you keep going, it's like the greatest thing that's ever happened. They they make so much noise. It's crazy. <laughs> it's like it's like we're throwing the most insane form up there. Exactly. And so that's what happened. And like a champ, you kept going and did your thing. Um, and it, it was just the perfect moment, right? And then all everything that happened on stage after that, it just felt right. You know what I mean? Like picking you up, parading you around the stage, carrying the Warrior Cup off. It was just, it was so special. Um, so thank you, Jake, for that moment. I'll never forget that. And um, that's it's just such it's such a fun story to tell because of like how much really went into it. Um, but anyway, so there's that. And uh, I want to do another. Okay, this is another one that maybe pulls on the heartstrings a little bit as we start to close out the show. Right. We only got two more questions, and we're out of here. So this one is: we rewind all the way back to there, 2014. I think you were still on AKA at the time, right? And so now, fast forward. You have achieved your dream. You've realized your dream of being on Paul Mitchell, winning U.S. Opens, right? And now, as we've had kind of another one of these generational shifts, you find yourself, despite only being, what, 19 years old, right? One of the longest tenured active members on the team and a leader of the team with so much new young talent on the roster. So tell us a little bit about how that is. I know how that feels. Let the people know how that feels. It's, you know, going into this, there's, it's really no pressure because all I have to do is, is show, show the team, show this new generation what, what the team's all about. So with, with open arms and most of these people were already my brothers, like, like the people coming up from competitive veg and now like Alex, like we're like best friends. So now it's just, it, it's, it's family now. And, and to take that, that role, it's just show them. Show, show them what the team's about. And that's that's not hard at all. That's exciting. Show them what, what y'all showed me. Show them that same feeling. Show them what the team's been about for 35 years. It's, it, it's no big deal because I got that same love for the past, you know, six years. I just got to, I just got to keep it going. And, and it does feel weird to be on this team. Uh, it's the second longest um, to, to Sammy. And um, I feel a little bit old sometimes. Someone called me the OG, and I was like, "Whoa, <laughs> whoa!" <laughs> it, it, it doesn't it doesn't feel right because I've I've always been the young guy, like hanging out with with you and my brothers and stuff. Five years younger, it's I've always been the young guy, and it's it's weird for sure. That's why you had to grow out the beard, right, to fight off the little yeah. brother complex. Is that <laughs> I'm my own self now, but I guess I'm still growing a beard out like them, so. Still falling in their footsteps. Well, and, and that's the thing that I think is so great about your story is that 
you really did become your own self. And actually, you can say that about all of your siblings, right? Is that really none of you are alike in terms of your personality, in terms of your, your martial arts career and the way you've gone about it. Reed's is dynamically different from Cole's, is dynamically different from yours, is dynamically different from Avery's. And I think that's one thing that's so impressive about all of you is that you have successfully each carved your own paths in this sport and have different reputations, right? Reed, the double bow guy, Cole, the innovator, Jake, the wild card for all the reasons we've talked about, right? And then now Avery is that next one up who is very quickly making her own name for herself, right? Now, she is, is one of the other Presleys to get it right and choose to be a great single bow competitor, right? Um, you and Avery got that part of it right. We and Cole didn't get the memo. <laughs> um, but hey, anyway, Cole, Cole, Cole did bow one time. That is true. He did bring out some single bow, the, but then he picked up his Thomas too, or vice versa. You see, like, you know what yeah. I mean? It's, it's just kind hey, of and people forget, Reed single bow was very good. Underrated. Reed single bow is an underrated competitor all time. I agree. Very good. And one more shout out. That was a very Jason Warren-esque form. His Reed single bow. Very good. It was. Which reminds me, we also got to get Reed back on the podcast because it's been way too long since Reed's been on. So, hey, like Lebanon, Tennessee. Uh, well, I guess Reed and Cole don't live in Lebanon. But you know what I'm saying, right? Tennessee boys. Yeah, Tennessee boys. We, we got three of you that still need to come on this show, right? We need Cole. We need Jason for the first time. We got to get Reed back on. I think when Reed was on the first time, we did a film study. So we were just watching videos. We didn't even get to talk about Reed that much. So we need to have Reed on just to talk about Reed more because that, I mean, that could go on for like three hours, right? Reed uh, has, a, has, a, has a very unique story. And then y'all's story is also awesome. Because right. uh, a lot of people don't know that Reed kind of, innovated that double bow when he had his Achilles blown up. Mm -hmm. So exactly. he was working on that while sitting down. Mm -hmm. Which is crazy, right? And I yeah. still remember Reed like on the little scooter, like <laughs> just trying to get around the house. And it, like he was working double bows in smack while on that scooter trying to figure out how to do it. But anyway, so if you guys couldn't already tell, you got a lot of great podcast episodes coming up shortly. In addition to those Tennessee boys, I've got some other guests lined up that are going to be a whole lot of fun. So everybody stay tuned. Jake, I only got one more question for you. Man. We've talked about your career achievements, all those great moments. We've talked about how big the U.S. Open was for you. What is next for you? What motivates you to continue doing this? What does Jake Presley want to do next in the sport karate world? With sport karate, I want to – well, first off, just – keep this this energy going of course keep this up because that's like the first first tournament that really everything fell into place hopefully keeping that energy going now i've had a lot of people talking to me about doing some different things in the future this is no promises in the future i want to try to round out some of my my competition and i talked about this for us open maybe throwing in some korean forms and and because it's been a while since i've done this but in the future i would like to fight and a lot of people think or like kind of laugh at me like oh but like i did fight for for a long time in nasca and uh, i want to kind of bring that back now it's a lot different if i go and fight you know there's a plethora of amazing athletes so i need to train for about two more years and then i might be ready <laughs> but i love that like even just like the the drive and you know it's legit if you're gonna come out and publicly say it right a lot of people are like oh yeah i'd fight you know what i mean don't tell anybody right no <laughs> the fact that you're willing to like come out and say it publicly that shows like a genuine desire to want to do it which is respectable right and then if you actually do do it that's like that's huge because there's very few people in the modern era that have gone out and done both, right? And been successful at both, right? There are people that have done it. Rashad's a great example of somebody who does it right now, both the fighting and the forms of weapons. But those names are few and far between, right? And so for you to do it at the level that you've reached as a forms of weapons competitor and to go out there and be in a fighting division would be huge. And by the way, all the point fighters watching this, because there's a lot of great lightweights out there right now, right? There's a reputation 
Now, when a forms and weapons guy comes over to y'all's division, you hit a little bit hard, you hit a little bit late, okay? You can hit Jake hard, he can take it, that's fine. You hit Jake late, I'm coming in the ring, okay? <laughs> when Jake goes out there to fight, don't hit late, I'm coming in the ring. It's and then Coach and then Coach scary. Damon steps in the ring. I was about to say, I might not be very scary, but if I come in the ring, Coach Damon's coming in the ring, okay? And then we're going to have real problems. <laughs> anyway, so Jake, man, this show has been so much fun. Thank you so much for your time. Everybody tuning in. The numbers this whole time have been great. I hope you guys have really enjoyed this. The Jacksonville Podcast is back. We're going to be back every week moving forward until other crazy life stuff happens again. But for now, we're going to be back every single week. We've got some awesome guests planned for you guys. Jake, any final thoughts before we close out the show? Just thank you so much for having me on. It's been a blast, and uh, hopefully I'll be back on in the future. Absolutely, man. You're welcome back anytime. So once again, this has been the Jackson Rudolph Podcast. I'm your host, Jackson Rudolph. That was episode 104, which is crazy. We'll be back with episode 105 next week. I'll see you next time.